Good morning, everyone. Um, and good morning, everyone here. I'm very happy to see quite a few people here. And also, good morning uh, to the people online, or good afternoon, or whenever you watch this. Um, welcome to this meeting uh, with HRF, the uh, Hotel and Restaurant Workers Union. <laughs> Is that right in English? Uh, uh, fair Travel, the Schistria uh, and Unit Union, who organizes this uh, meeting about Myanmar and the development uh, tourism. Um, following a number of decades uh, of military rule and isolation, Myanmar now is uh, going through changes. Uh, the extent of the changes is still uh, under debate, and what is happening is still not certain to everyone, not even in the countries, uh, in the country, especially not to us. But nonetheless, we have seen a big increase in tourism, and we have a lot of job opportunities in tourism. And what we're going to discuss here is if tourism can be a positive factor for democratic change that, at, and, and inclusive growth. Can everyone benefit from tourism in Myanmar? And how can I be of a greater good as a tourist? Can I, can I do something uh, to actually help the situation in Myanmar to become even better. So welcome, and uh, my name is Patrick. I will try to um, facilitate the meeting or, and uh, bring everyone in with questions, which I'm going to ask you to keep until uh, in the last uh, quarter of the seminar. Uh, my name is Patrick, as I said. I'm a program manager at Union to Union, one of the organizers of this meeting. Uh, Union to Union is the Swedish trade union's international uh, solidarity cooperation uh, forum. We support trade unions in about, so, oh, we support the Swedish trade unions in their support to around 80 to 90 countries around the world. And in Myanmar, we support the ITUC through the Swedish confederations, LO and TCO, uh, in their work with, uh, with uh, labor law, which is one of the issues that is quite uh, um, important now in Myanmar, as the labor law doesn't really exist. It ex ex exists some sort of labor law, but otherwise the labor market is, is, is um, uh, dealing with a number of laws that are in some cases conflicting with each other. And we also support industrial, it works within the mining sector, and, base, uh, and most importantly in this case we support uh, HRF, the Swedish Hotel and Restaurant Workers Union, and IUF, the International Organization for Hotel and Restaurant and More Workers, um, in a project uh, supporting trade unions in the hotel and restaurant uh, industry. Um, as I said, in Myanmar, uh, the trade unions are struggling with labor laws, which are non, kind of non-existing, but exist a number of them that are, might be conflict and might be used in various uh, government agencies and different courts use them in different ways. It's, hard, it's a hard job for a trade union to understand all the rights that are in place. And also, as we have seen uh, in, in the Myanmar case, also the workers are very unaware of the rights of being part of the trade union, of the rights of being non-abused in, in hotels and restaurants by owners, managers, and so on. So there is a lot of work to do um, with us. We have Frida Carlson. Uh, you may, if you want to, go up, get up on stage now. Um, Frida Carlson uh, is from uh, HRF, the Hotel and Restaurant Workers Federation of Sweden. And uh, you uh, uh, quite recently visited Myanmar, uh, and you're going to present something about that uh, and how you can see, how you as a trade union see tourism as a possibility uh, for change, and how do you go about that in, uh, uh, in developing countries with low unit density and in some cases questionable human rights uh, record. Uh, we also have with us uh, Pascal Tue, who have returned to Myanmar uh, quite recently in 2012, after a number of years in, uh, in exile in, in London, in uh, all over the place basically, London, Oslo, Thailand, so on, who have come back to uh, promote and uh, take part in this change that is going on. Uh, to try to find a community-based tourism and uh, inclusive tourism that uh, involves as many people as possible. And also with us we have Dr. Aung Miat Kiao, yeah, yeah. sorry about the uh, pronunciation, uh, who has work, uh, been working with the 
number of different organizations. One of them is the uh, tourism board that you said uh, you, you created one yourself, the private companies to create the tourist board because the state didn't do it at the time and now the state is getting more and more involved in promoting tourism. And uh, you, the, you two of you will talk about what is going on on community-based uh, tourism, on the growth of tourism and, and how this can be uh, promoting um, the change in Myanmar. Uh, we have set that we have three different speakers, and I'm gonna try to wrap it up at quarter to ten, maybe, and then we're gonna have questions. So hold on, take notes, and uh, raise them at the end, and I will try to. Uh, you can ask questions in Swedish if you want as well. Um, so, with no further ado, I would like to ask uh, Pascal if you want to get up on stage uh, and uh, to say what you want to say uh, to the others. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Pascal Kuthwe. Um, I am, uh, as Patrick was saying about my background, I came back to uh, Myanmar in 2012 with the invitation of previous government uh, to help the people. And the interesting thing for me is not only the um, the the change of government, but the, the way transitional period makes uh, the country a kind of vibrant place, but very confusing. So the, the, when I came to 2012, everything seems to be, you know, in order. Uh, the the government's in control, and also the uh, the people <laughs> seems to be quiet. They don't uh, quietly excited. But it turns out that there were a lot of things that didn't show that time. Partly because we are used to um, oppression. And that oppression combined with uh, the fear since 1962 when the, the country was taken over by the military government. So for me, I look at my country with a neutral eye, not from the point of view of uh, someone actively involved in the politics or someone just staying outside. And uh, the situation now regarding democratization and normalization is at best uh, chaotic and sporadic, particularly when it comes to trying to change the institutional uh, situation. But the good news is the, there are many people uh, who want to, and also working hard on it, to change for the better, including my friends and colleagues here who came with us today. These people are the foot soldiers who work hard for the countries, for themselves, for the communities. And that's what keeps me going to want to get involved in development of our country. So I can give an example. For example, like now I'm working in uh, a small state called KR, uh, which I'll give out leaflets to you later if you want to know more about it. And when I, was, when I came back, the minister, one of the ministers asked me to go and help our people, the motors place where there were fightings and also clashes between the um, ethnic groups like ours and the Myanmar army or Burmese army. But uh, I took the challenge. I knew it was going to be difficult. But the process of uh, the luck for me was I knew uh, the people who were fighting against the government also knew the government's officers and the like. So I could be a kind of uh, kind of facilitator for something uh, for the better. And luckily also uh, they signed a ceasefire agreements at that time. So when we went there, it wasn't the, uh, the authorities that we had problems with because the authority at least have a sense of understanding the whole picture but it was the villages at the bottom. 
And you can imagine those villages for 60 years, they've been living under this armed conflict. And when there were fightings or clashes, uh, they either abused by anyone who had the guns were the masters. That turned the villagers into inward looking, never trust anyone outside. They even saw that I was kind of facilitating for big companies to take over the village. That kind of misunderstanding happened. But as we went on, the, the beauty of it is they realized that the life could be rebuilt because nobody thought that things could get better. They think that everything will go worse and worse and worse. So they lo almost lost their spirit of uh, wanting to recreate, create their life, rebuild it. So what we did was we explained very patiently. It took us longer to explain to them than to train them for uh, the uh, village development. In this case, uh, uh, inclusive tourism for the whole village and also for the supply and change. So. The, the organization I've been working for is called ITC, International Trade Center, and it is based in Geneva. But our project in Kaya State is funded by the Dutch uh, government for three years project. And the idea is to make tourism beneficial to all the people concerned, particularly to the local community. For example, in 1912, when I went to the village, on average, Tourists go to this village called Pampe, which is known for uh, long neck ladies, which is also my tribe. And they are also exploited in Thailand, used as human zoo. As you know, tourists had to pay uh, $20 to go in to see them, take picture, and give them a little bit of money and go out. And there is degrading experience they had. And these, and these people, they originally come from Myanmar in our area. And we don't want to make the same mistake like some people are doing in their country. So we help them build their communities to give back to them a sense of dignity. And so now we are at the stage where the villagers can manage their own affairs when it comes to their community tourism. We don't have to force them. They know the ideas about what they uh, expect the tourists to be like, and also what uh, what we call is uh, three S's the, the, in tourism: safety for the villagers and the guests, service, and then story. So now we have the interaction uh, between tourists and villagers. Before it was only the tourists imposing their life onto the the, the villages. Now the villages also can share what they want tourists to see and also they share in, in a genuine way. So this is one of the, I see as a kind of uh, democratization in the village area. But in the city it will be different because uh, the people, uh, this, people who go to the cities themselves are kind of refugees from the, the countryside because of the past uh, land grabbings and everything. So those areas are much more complicated, as Frida will, will explain, hopefully, and also more uh, entrenched, because the difficulties for the authorities themselves, not only the, the present rulers, but the, the past rulers, they are, they are law-making, the system were based on fear, and that fear for example, people who had power before are afraid that people might chase after them for whatever international trial. The new government is afraid that the old government might, military might take over again. That kind of fear factor played a very big role. But they are, the, all the parties genuinely want the change. Change them, what the Burmese say is, like the dispute between the squirrel and uh, the bees. The, the, the bees can build a nest underneath the tree and the squirrel can walk over. They have that kind of mentality. But it hasn't, imp uh, what do you, I would say, it hasn't really, uh, since the 2015 election, things have been really moved to the right direction. I noticed that. It is partly many factors, including uh, the un 
inability for the new government to move the uh, civil servants, because civil servants also uh, was built on the form of the military rule. So ev almost every department, the heads, the directors are ex-army officers, and they have that kind of control over the normal civil servants that makes it so hard for the normal people to create things because they play on rule books, but these rule books, as Frederick was saying, they clash with each other, so you have a lot of red tapes. But I'm not depressed about it. I am uh, kind of optimist, but not uh, uh, too optimistic, a pragmatic person. And if we can keep on uh, kind of pushing uh, the system to the right direction, uh, it will move. But at the moment, I think uh, the new government also needs support, not only the verbal support or monetary support, but the right advice, the right uh, kind of um, injection of technical know-how. So this is my impression to the time being. And I hope um, we also be able to solve it peacefully because even though uh, things are going well in some places, some places are going bad to worse. So th uh, that could really, again, uh, cause a bit of frictions and uh, tension. So as for the travel industry, hotel and tourism, it does play uh, a good role in normalizing and helping the people to uh, empower themselves. But we need proper policies, and there are some policy on the books, but we haven't really had the uh, power to really impl apply to the real situation. So that's what uh, my feelings about uh, the country. And you can ask me questions later. I will end with this one. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. I did wrote out a few questions. I will get back to you later on. Um, Dr. Aung, would you like to to the stage, please? And I think it's better if you introduce the number of uh, shares you have as well, because I didn't. I think I didn't do justice completely. Uh, my name is Dr. Aung Mia Cho. Uh, I am. A, I was a dentist. Uh, when the schools were closed, I had to study for ten years, and uh, since there were no possibilities because electricity was not there, and they send you in the countryside where a dentist cannot practice, so I become a travel agent. Uh, uh, the first two years were very good. And we saw people going to Thailand for the beach. So uh, by accident, I happened to arrive to the Kapali beach at that time. It took me 18 hours bus drive to get to Kapali beach, where this villager uh, that have palm trees. So I asked if it was possible. So then we started building a small hotel, 25 room hotel, which increased now to 74 rooms. Uh, then uh, I, I was in the, I mean, since then I'm in tourism, in tourism. That was 94 until today. When I started my company, I was 27, 27. Uh, during all those years, tourism was not welcome because people, the government outside was saying, don't go to Burma and the military government, for the military government at that time, tourists were problems because all the political movements of foreigners who come and distribute papers were tourists. So uh, for us in the tourism industry, it was not uh, easy. Uh, there were off and ons. In 2006 was one of the best years, best years, where Tourism was increasing, everyone in the industry were happy, where all of a sudden in 2007 monks 
went into the streets. I remember as a travel agent on the month of November, I had 700 booked. And when they went to the streets, I saw I was in front of my office where the rows of monks and people uh, were demonstrating. I, I was left with 30 tourists out of 700. In 2008, we have Cyclone Nargis. Cyclone Nargis, so there was no business because that cyclone devastating and uh, so tourists don't come because tourism is very much dependent on the situation. 2009 was a financial crisis. 2010, uh, uh, the referendum and the elections were were expected in, in Myanmar, so people were hesitant to visit. So uh, I happened to be here in Stockholm uh, to study a little bit about uh, the collective bargaining. Okay, uh, I was. This was a, pro a program by NIR, NIR. Okay, because in 2010 and and so they were pre preparing to open the country for this change. Uh, for this change, so uh, we had a opportunity to visit the some unions, office, uh, the 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 employers associations as well, and um, it was very nice. It, it opened me, uh, opened my my eyes. Uh, the feeling of that time. In the pe looking into the people's eye, I was told by the foreign experts and uh, consultants, there was no hope, because even in 2011, when the government, the new government, the semi-civilian government took over, it wasn't real. Meaning, people do not believe what was going on, until when uh, the Secretary of State of the U.S. and the President Obama came to Myanmar and tourists start to flock into the country and those hotels that for the last 10 years they were merely uh, they never paid tax because they were not able because they were trying to pay the the staff and cover the electricity charges okay from $70 they increased to 270 uh, there was a lot of increase and for the very first time, tourists were flocking into Myanmar, and there was hope for other local three-star hotels that were ran down because no tourists were occupying the places, had a bit of money to, uh, to renovate the places. Today, uh, compared to five years ago, Myanmar has doubled the uh, room of the hotel's inventory uh, in, in, in the country. Uh, the... The city, the capital from Yangon was moved to Nepido, uh, where many people consider a ghost city. But nowadays, uh, we have lots of hotels there also. Um, today, I have never seen uh, the opportunity of employment that tourism, those developments, has offered in the country uh, never before never before. Those hotels now in some places that were built in uh, looking forward to the potential of growth growth uh, in tourism, some places are facing uh, oversupply. oversupply. In places like Nepido, where they were farmers, farmers, uh, they never thought they'd be working in the tourism industry. Now they created lots of jobs. So the concern today in such places where we, uh, oversupply is likely uh, to be the future, okay, we are concerned about the sustainability of their business. So uh, we are working together, we are working together that uh, they grow, they grow. Uh, in the past, it was not possible. Now was made possible. There is also another fact in the country. Uh, the infrastructure, road infrastructure, we don't have highways, but the infrastructure has improved. And there's a boom in the domestic tourism, which is contributing 
to the growth of tourism industry in Myanmar. It's not only the international arrivals, which uh, last year, according to last year's figures, 4.7 million. But out of this, only 1.3 over million is by entry points by air. Okay, what the let's call the genuine tourists, but the rest are from the border area, from Thailand, from China. This year, according to ministry figures, uh, there is a decrease in 38 uh, percent because uh, the the figures they are taking are different from that of last year. That uh, only the immigration figures that in come into the country, including the border area, except those autonomous states. In those, in some autonomous states, there is no Myanmar immigration. There are only the national race force. So this was excluded. That is China, including from China. So, so the, the, the way of putting in place the statistic, the real, let's say, tourists who come are a million and a half, and that continue to grow. So, uh, in some states in Myanmar, where now they have a sign for peace, and then, uh, for example, the current state, current state. In the past, we could not go. Even as a Myanmar, uh, we don't feel safe to go. And if we, if they go, there are uh, chances that the the, the, the car were shot, or at least psychologically, we were not free, or maybe safe to go, because tourism is safety. Uh, a few years back, I went there. I, I went there because it was possible for tourists to go, tourists to go also. So, I myself went there. It was good to see the troops of the current troops, meaning not the government troops. They were waving. They were traveling. So I. Uh, Peace is something that doesn't bring people into their place, but also them out of the jungle. So this was a good feeling. And to sustain that peace, because peace is also based on the development, the peaceful development of the area, increasing the livelihood, the possibility. So tourism can play a vital role for such places. And what's happening is those places in current state, there were first not uh, accessible because of safety, are now firstly visited by the locals, the domestic tourism, which actually they are, they are coming up with shops, restaurants, you know. Uh, the issue uh, today in Myanmar is not actually the number of international tourists coming there, but also from uh, Let's environmental uh, sustainability point of view is the domestic market that is growing, domestic tourism that is growing. So uh, that's why, uh, uh, luckily, luckily, the last government, the Minister of Tourism, managed to get uh, uh, support from the Norwegian government to do a tourism master plan. Uh, before that, they have the policy on responsible tourism. Uh, to make Myanmar a better place to live and a better place to visit. So based on the fact uh, that we that, had that policy with tourism uh, master plan and we also have policy as a government, uh, policy on community participation and policy, ecotourism policy for protected areas. Well, we have documents. Uh, the, the, the challenge is to turn those documents into living documents. Now, the, the, we have different programs, programs that need development partners, development partners, which were, uh, one is the CBI project, what, that's why we are here helping the tourism uh, the, uh, uh, industry to, to develop. The other one, I would say, is the ITC program that Mr. Pascal is here and the Kaya State to for a to grow sustainable. We're trying to uh, make uh, a sustainable growth of tourism in the Kaya State. So those are the challenges we're going moving forward. 
uh, I talked about the possibilities of employment, okay? But the other, uh, the possibility, the potential of of tourism helping the country for peace, for economic development. But we also have the issues because of some some uh, issues, especially in particular in the tourism restaurants and hotel industry. We have uh, experience in Bagan, for example. We had problems with the workers, especially uh, on the, the the distribution of service charges. Okay, uh, the you. The law for formation of unions is there. The law for employment is there. The employment requires a contract between the employer and the employee with the, with the, a term that is renewable every year. So uh, the law came in, different, different laws. But the implementation part is a challenge because when uh, as an employer, we, said we need to do a sign a contract because this contract has to be given to the ministry uh, or office of the Ministry of Labour to be registered and checked. Uh, the, our employees, they, they fear the end of the year, the term a year, their contracts will not be extended. So we have to... Uh, Tell them we have to. No, no, no. This is just because by law we have to do that, okay? And uh, these are the situation. And we want to talk about the union. Uh, most of the time, the employers were concerned about the union. On the other hand, the u the, the unions they took uh, as a uh, to overcome their fear. You know, this we have a union. But I was told by foreign consultants that, that this union thing, uh, it's foreign, foreign. In Myanmar, there are still societies that live and shared in time of difficulty, like in the past, in the past. But nevertheless, we're moving to a global uh, environment because Myanmar, the walls that separated Myanmar from the rest of the world are gone. So we have to tr go through this. Uh, at the moment, it's moment of transition. It's a process. And uh, it is good. It is good. For example, I employ about 200 in the hotel I have now at the beach. It is much easier for us to talk to the leaders rather than talking to all the 200. So it was, uh, it was good. Uh, and, and thank God, because I, I had this opportunity to, to, to learn a bit of collective negotiation. So that, was, that made me easy to communicate with the leaders of uh, our, our union in my hotel is not officially registered, but they have the leaders that which I, we can talk to, refer to. So this is my also my personal experience. It will take time. It will take time to, uh, to build understanding. It will take time. But it is good that things are happening and the potential is there. And I am optimistic because Myanmar, we can only be better. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jung. And <clears throat> we, we heard now from the, uh, you're also an employer. So we heard from the employer side what, what, uh, what is going on and how can, can you benefit from collective agreement. And now we're hopefully going to hear something from Frida about how your employees, or not your employees in this case, but employees of Myanmar can benefit from collective agreements as well and what their struggles are. So, Frida. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Um, so my name is Frida Karlsson. I work at the Swedish Hotel and Restaurant Workers Trade Union, uh, the HRF. Uh, 
and uh, we are also affiliated, as Patrick mentioned in the beginning, to a global trade union federation called the IUF, which is the International Union for Food Production, Agriculture and uh, Tourism Workers. Uh, so I will speak to you a bit about a uh, trade union perspective on uh, sustainability and sustainable tourism. Uh, and to start up, I, I do use these questions uh, for myself and I want to share them with you. So what are the greatest opportunities and challenges for those who work within the tourism sector? How can the situation be improved and how can sustainability in the tourism sector become a reality? So, to consider these questions, I also consider three words, which is value, fear, and human rights. Uh, and, of course, um, focusing on decent work as a sustainability, and uh, the social part of sustainability, you also have the economic development and the environmental part of sustainability. But as a trade union, we work with the social part. And to understand uh, sustainability, poverty wages, uh, we need to understand uh, uh, something about the value in uh, in tourism industry, uh, and especially value for certain kinds of labour. So within the hospitality sector, the tourism sector, we are often referring to to employments and work as unskilled labour or unskilled work. Uh, in Sweden, we hear a lot about easy jobs today. Uh, and so, to consider this, I want to take an example of a hotel housekeeper. Okay, so what does a clean room mean to a guest, right, when you're coming to a hotel? What does a clean room mean to a guest? It's kind of valuable. But these hotel housekeepers, they work within high stress. They clean about 10 rooms or more per day, or they have a working rate about uh, 10 to 15 minutes per room. And this includes heavy lifting, a very rough working environment. Sometimes uh, it is even includes hazardous chemical products to clean. Uh, and uh, they go home with a lot of pain, especially back pain. So we've done a services on this. And we ask uh, workers to, to mark on a body map to see where they have pain. And they always have pain when they go home from work. Um, so they have a very rough working environment. And they are also put through a high risk of being harassed, and especially sexual harassment. Uh, because you don't know what room you're getting into, who is there, who might be there or not. There's a power relation between a, a tourist and, and the workers. Um, and there can also be a power relation between the employer and the worker, of course. Uh, so this categorization of unskilled work and labor is reinforces and is reinforced by uh, systematic discrimination. Okay, so housekeepers are increasingly denied access to to the same benefits as as other kind of workers. Uh, they are at special risk uh, and hotel workers overall, uh, and that can uh, sometimes include medical benefits. And considering the high work and the high lifting that they're doing, it's something that's really necessary for them. Uh, and added to this, and uh, concerning hotel housekeepers and hotel workers uh, in general, actually, it's uh, gender discrimination and discrimination against migrant workers as well. Because within this sector, in the hotel sector, especially hotel housekeepers, uh, the people working there are normally women or migrant workers. And then we have the perspective of fear, okay? Uh, so when we talk about the value, uh, the answer should be quite simply. Uh, they should, workers should just demand the value of their work uh, relative to their income, right? So why don't they? Why don't they do that? What is the hesitation for this? So the answer is fear. And there's different kinds of fear. It's the speak out, uh, to fear to speak out, uh, to complain. It's a fear to fail. So you fear that it might result in penalties or something like that. There's a fear to stop work. You have a job, right? At least you have a job. Uh, even if it's sometimes dangerous or very, very heavy. There's a fear to report because it's of uh, intimidation from sometimes management, uh, and there can also be harassment, including sexual harassment. Uh, and there's a fear to, to ask for, for paid breaks or uh, fear to, to say enough for excessive workloads or, or uh, work, long working times. 
Uh, and there's also a fear of speaking out and saying more, like my income is not enough. So you have this kind of fear. Uh, and this fear is even bigger when you have insecurity within your job. If, if you have a precarious kind of work, and an unsecure uh, income uh, and not a fixed term contract, there's even a higher risk for fear. Uh, and so direct permanent employment uh, and access to, to the rights, knowing about the rights, is essential when we're speaking of sustainable jobs. And sustainable jobs in its turn is, is essential when we speak about sustainable tourism as well. So this kind of persuasive procures employment, uh, especially among housekeepers, but among hotel workers overall. Uh, and the human rights risk is stemming from this form of employment means that hotels and tour operators uh, unconcerned about this is in fact very unsustainable today. Uh, so my point is kind of like where insecurity is, there will always be fear. It doesn't matter if we have complaining mechanisms or auditings and stuff like that. Where there are insecure jobs, there are also a very high risk for fear. Uh, and then we have the human rights issue, right? Uh, you can, there's uh, unfair dismissal sometimes uh, due to trade union involvement, uh, and that is in fact a human rights violation. Uh, I have the example of Bagan as well. Uh, I visited there in 2015. At, at that time, there were five trade union leaders of the HLOB, which is the trade union federation uh, for hotel workers in Bagan. Uh, they had been unfairly dismiss, dismissed, fired, uh, without any legal grounds. There were no grounds for their dismissal. Uh, and so uh, they got a lot of support as well from the trade union members. Uh, and uh, the management continued to defy that they should be reinstated. And there was a law decision made uh, that they should be reinstated because there was a lack of legal ground for the dismissal. Uh, but the management continued to, to not implement this reinforcement. Uh, and uh, they also resorted to a, a law that was made in 2014 in Myanmar, uh, which allows up to two years to appeal to the court decision. So imagine two years fighting for your way back into work, two years without an income. That's kind of rough, right? Uh, and they... Uh, they got help from the IUF, the International Union Federation for Workers. Uh, and so together they filed an ILO complaint for freedom of associations. Uh, and so uh, with tremendous courage of this, the union members, the trade union leaders and, uh, and the HLOB as a, a free and independent trade union in Myanmar, they were finally reinstated. I think it took about one and a half year overall. Um, they were finally reinstated. And so that kind of marked a very critical turning point in the Myanmar for recognizing trade unions as having a right to speak up for themselves and having a right to negotiate. Um, and it also shows that uh, corporate uh, responsibility on human rights is, uh, is vital and uh, a corporate cannot pick and choose on what human rights they should be concerned about. They need to be concerned about all the aspects of human rights when they're working, and especially in which they are involved in the process of human rights within the work, trade union rights. Uh, and they, corporates cannot either hide behind a state failure of implementing these human rights. Okay, so they still have an independent responsibility to enhance these human rights. Uh, even if the state is unable or, or not willing to, to reinforce human rights issues. So how is HRF involved in, in all of this? <laughs> uh, HRF is a trade union, uh, does cooperate and have solidarity within uh, uh, all over the world, it's globally, and we are uh, a lot of affiliated members to the IUF, the International Union, um, federation uh, and HRF uh, actually funds a project within the whole Asia Pacific area uh, and, and uh, where Myanmar is included. This picture is from uh, 2015 when we visited uh, the, area, uh, the city of Bagan in Myanmar. 
Uh, and together in this project, our common goals as trade unions are responsible, ethical and sustainable tourism, uh, access to workers' human rights, uh, especially trade union rights, of course, and collective bargaining. Um, and we do this to enhance the working conditions, the working environment, and to raise the income of workers. Uh, and our tools for this together is training. So in, in Myanmar, it's a lot about training on basic human trade union rights. But we also do training on, on leadership within trade unions, training on uh, negotiations and collective bargaining. Uh, and together that would build the capacity for workers, human rights, sustainable jobs and also gender equality. Uh, because this sector is, uh, is uh, overrepresented mostly by women uh, globally. And, and also through organizational strengthening, like the more members we are together, the stronger we will become, both locally, nationally and globally. Uh, but we also do cooperate on cli climate change mitigations. Uh, and this is to develop uh, effective initiatives to respond to climate change so that we can secure sustainable jobs, because that is the factor of having a sustainable tourism, right? So, uh, trade unions rights are human rights. And the value of trade unions to sustainability is highly important to have sustainable jobs. An organized workforce at a workplace uh, with genuine rep representation of the workers uh, can help uh, contribute to transparency of the company. Uh, union representatives speak collectively, so as you probably noticed, uh, it makes it easier for the management as well to speak to, to one person rather than all of them, uh, claiming the same, same rights together. And the knowledge among the workers within the hotel sectors uh, on their rights help them to, to lift themselves out of poverty or where there are unfair conditions of their work. Uh, so they gain access to human rights, knowing about their rights at work as well. And also the corporation is taking responsibility for the social part of sustainability and human rights. Uh, and trade unions are also, of course, a democratic organization, so it enhances the process for democracy. Uh, we do educate workers on their rights, uh, training them to speak up for themselves, training them to, to collective bargaining and taking part in the domestic process all over the country or within the region. So, And as a trade union, uh, speaking of sustainable tourism, we do have a, a right-based approach. Uh, so we speak about uh, responsible tourism, which should include... Um, employers' responsibility for their national and international standards on human rights, as well as um, environmental issues and uh, cultural heritage and cultural values. It's highly important. We also, also speak about ethical tourism, uh, and that should include opposing to child sex tourism and trafficking of any kind. Uh, and also to tackle corruption and organized criminal activities. It's a high risk of these issues within the tourism sector. So that's why we, we promote that as well. It's the ethical part of, of sustainability. And then we talk about sustainable tourism, uh, which for us should um, promote sustainable jobs, uh, job security and decent incomes, decent work for all workers. So we believe that workers' uh, vulnerability and the lacks, lack of access to ri rights disconnect their wages and livelihoods from the huge profits that the tourism uh, has experienced within Asia today. So the tourism is uh, booming in, in Myanmar as well. So the income of the tourism sector should be reflected in the value of the work of the workers. So that's why we also, that's, that's kind of the trade union's work to uh, to organize collectively bargaining and campaigning to be able to reconnect the profits of the tourism in industry to reflect upon the income and value of the workers as well. And HRF is also part uh, in the Swedish network of fair travel, Kustresande. Uh, 
and we work together with uh, some trade unions and some NGO that are members of this network. We want to raise an awareness among consumers and tourists about the footprints that you're making when you are uh, touristing in another visiting another country, uh, because uh, the tourists also play a vital part of keeping the, the tourism sustainable. Uh, we also want to engage the tourism operators to take the responsibility through the whole supply chain. Uh, yeah, to, to what impact they have on the local community, the land, the environment and the social parts of their destinations and where they are. So tour operators working from Sweden, flying Sweden, Swedish people to Myanmar, for example, should be aware of their supply chain. So what kind of hotels are they using? Are the hotel housekeepers on, on uh, contract uh, employments, uh, the laundries that the hotels are using, the bakeries, and everything is that. Uh, and we also promote um, sustainable business travels, uh, kind of recently making sure that it's a lot of travels is not just for fun these days, but it's also a lot of business travel and that should be sustainable as well. Uh, and we also, as a network, want to contribute to long-term strategies for sustainable tourism as well. Uh, and uh, a lot of our work are aimed towards the, the consumer and the tourism. So we do have some advice, uh, call it the tips lista in Swedish, um, on how you can make your travels more fair. Uh, so we, we ask for you to ask questions and demand for fair travels, even if, it, if it's the tour operator you're going with or if it's the hotel or the flight company, ask them questions on how they work on sustainable tourism, how they work with trade union rights and such things. Because that makes them aware that that's an issue for you, and so they have to do something about that. We also encourage tourists to, to show respect for local costumes and uh, tradition. You should be well prepared and read up on, on the country you're going to or the place you're visiting, so you know what to expect and so that there can be a good exchange from your visit, both for the local people and for yourself. We also encourage people to shop and eat locally, uh, and this is uh, because uh, your, your visit should gain the, the local community with the economic funds that you're using when you're visiting them. So if you go to a big company, maybe go outside the area and, uh, and um, try the locals, local stuff as well, both for your own experience but to gain the, the local economic development. Uh, and you should adapt your travels uh, for the environment. Uh, if, you, if you can, stay away longer, uh, so you don't have to take too much time of flight emissions. Um, take a biking tour in the place you're visiting, if possible. Uh, so just adapt your travel and be concerned about the environment when you're there. And also save on water and electricity. There's uh, water scarcity in the world today, and where there might not be water scarcity, there might be an unfair distribution of water between the, the big businesses of hotels and the local people. So you could uh, try to take shorter t uh, showers or swim in the ocean instead of a pool and eat more vegetables uh, rather than meat, because that uses a lot more uh, water when you're producing. Uh, producing them. Uh, so just be aware of the access for local people to their water and uh, electricity as well. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, so thank you. I'm going to open up the floor for questions. If Pascal and uh, Dr. Ayum, if you want to join us on stage, and then I'm going to I'm going to open up and do two questions of my own. Uh, one of them is: quite recently, the trade union movement realized that we need to work on environmentally friendly green jobs because on a, on on a, I think it was saying on a dead planet there are no jobs, and we need to to be participate in creating uh, jobs and, and uh, uh, production that is green so we can actually continue this work. 
<coughs> this is very, very visible in the tourism area. You have um, uh, you, the, the tourism uh, industry itself can actually, uh, in some cases, kill the factor that draw the tourists. Uh, I don't know, but Inner Lake is kind of in the, that state now in, in, in Myanmar. And do, do you see that Myanmar would be able to cope with this, in, in the, uh, to actually do this in a green way, uh, both from the government side, and, but also from you as an employer and then as uh, organizations that, that look into this? And the other question I'm going to give you is, is more personal, not, not so much in global, but will all ethnic groups of Myanmar be involved in this? Uh, will all ethnic groups be involved in, in the end? Uh, because it's, they are not at the moment. Will they be the same in the future? Is, what, what do you think about that? Um, definitely, it is very important. Uh, in the question you asked about the green, it's very difficult. It's very difficult because sometimes when uh, for for us, is very is waste management, and that help also that also has economical benefits. Sometimes uh, it is very hard for us. When knowing it, we transmit the importance, but not always is followed. So it is a situation. It's a big challenge in Myanmar, where. I mean, even in, for example, in Bagan, in Bagan we have the plastic campaign. The plastic campaign every Saturday, uh, the hoteliers gather together, even with their staff, to clean. But as tourists arrive, especially when I said the explosion of domestic tourists, they steal through plastic. So it's a big issue. So this is what I mean, it is an example that, regardless of all the efforts that were done, still when tourists at this point domestic they were not aware of i mean i mean behaving with the environmental friendly instincts so that's a very big challenge uh, when you say about the the, the, the everyone okay uh, tourism is very important for I, I said in the states like kachin and also chin uh, no, uh, Karen and Chin. For example, Chin State is very difficult. It's very remote. It's near bordering India, so, India, uh, with the Seven Sisters, the Assam, Manipur. No, uh, it's very difficult also to grow because because they are they're in high altitude. So the only way to to, to increase uh, economical benefits is through tourism. There's no other way. So. Uh, that area is another area which uh, we're trying to open it up because tourism is the only way to help them uh, economically first. Then, of course, then we have to. Uh, they have they, they they're in high altitude, alpine uh, climate, but they need tourism to help. So. Uh, the rest of the place is peace because some areas are do not developed because uh, it is not safe to go. Not safe to go, but it is helping. Thank you. Questions from the floor? Yeah, take one here first. Okay, uh, I'm Johanna and I'm from the Swedish Burma Committee. Uh, and we are an independent organization based here in Stockholm and we support civil society organizations in Myanmar. Thank you very much for your interesting presentations. Uh, but I have a question uh, regarding land grabbing. Uh, Dr. Ang, you talked about uh, Naypyidaw, for example, um, and that people uh, were working as farmers before now work in hotels. But for when, <laughs> when they moved the capital city to, from Yangon to Naypyidaw, uh, we also had lots of cases of land grabbing. So my question is, how can we expand tourism without uh, leading to cases of land grabbing? Thank you. Thank you. Did we have a question over here too? Take two at a time. Okay. Thank, <coughs> thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I just recently visited uh, Myanmar. Sometimes I don't know if I say, should say Myanmar or Burma, but anyway, uh, I'm Chris Develvar. I'm working for the Swedish Building Workers Unions here in Sweden, which is supporting also a networking of migrant workers in the region. And we are also now strategizing 
uh, a corporation in the country uh, when it comes to construction. And of course, construction is construction of hotels and infrastructures and so on. Uh, the interesting part is that investments to Myanmar comes directly from big players like China and South Korea. And let's be honest, they don't give a shit about human rights uh, <coughs> or trade union rights. That could be a major problem and um, maybe you can er elaborate around that. But uh, the key thing is actually for my question that the Swedish government is right now rethinking the strategy for Burma and Myanmar. And I would like you to reflect on if you get uh, to play, so to say, a part of that and give your views on what the Swedish government should prioritize in the four to five coming years. And to Frida, um, is there a strategy to bring any of the big hotel chains to the OECD for failing to respect the OEC guidelines for human and trade union rights. Thanks. We only have five minutes, so I think we just uh, st stick with those two questions for now. Good question. Uh, land grabbing is definitely an issue, and that is a national level issue, which as a private sector for me is very difficult. Uh, but uh, since I opened my little resort, 12-room resort along the beach in the countryside, at the very beginning of the village. Uh, yes, there was land grabbing. Uh, but break in reality, we are facing another problem. Uh, agriculture sector, Myanmar, Myanmar, is losing its worst workforce. It is, is a, a very big issue. Since Myanmar today is very, uh, very easy to get a passport and go out for work. Okay, now uh, we don't have labor, but we see lots in the countryside nowadays. We see lots of tractors, mechanization. We ask why there's no more labor, because simply they leave. They leave. They were not working in the field agriculture anymore. It's not only because they lost the land, because in fact there is no more labor. So. Uh, I'm trying to impose few uh, uh, two-wheel tractors now, also on, on the a different business. I'm start. I'm trying to start a new business, and that's where I I I, I try to make a research and where we found that, wow, Myanmar in a small, they have 500 tractors, for the reason because they can't find uh, labor. So this is a, a very uh, big challenge for Myanmar labor no more labor in the countryside, replaced by mechanization. So this is a fact that we cannot deny at the moment. Uh, this is w w one thing. The other thing with the, with the construction, we would definitely want to see in the construction business a lot of more investment. We were talking last night. Uh, now the West, especially with the change of government in the US, looking intern in internally, uh, we will see, we would like to see more business coming into Myanmar, investment coming into Myanmar from the West, and we do not want to depend only uh, from China. We, we really definitely, me, I had the opportunity to, to, to learn collective bargaining because of the Swedish government. I, I would say that Swedish co people, help well, we need more that's we need more it's just we want there we want you there with good practices thank you pascal can i get back to you as well on the issue of both uh, both land grabbing and you has been working outside of, of burma for quite some time hmm. uh coming in uh, is it, uh, the Swedish uh, strategy that uh, that Krista talked about is to, when it comes to foreign aid and investment and so on, uh, the Swedish government takes strategies. How do we work okay. with Myanmar uh, or any country? And, and if you would like to do an input, to, well, if you could, what would you tell the Swedish government to do with it? Okay, with I start with um, uh, international and uh, EU laws. So I think before the development, the, the, these countries should send environmental aid experts to assess the impact by tourism and hotel building. That's what I told our minister to, to for example, like the 
the, whole, uh, the, the, the archipelagos in southern Myanmar, uh, Myay Islands have a lot of uh, beautiful islands and corals, animals, and quite a lot of people are in those places. And I fe fear from, for example, the neighboring countries, Thailand and as well, that they tend to, uh, the big companies enforce their uh, will in the guise of consulting with the uh, local people. But no, they they just lobby local people and build hotels before we realize that we destroy our natural resources. So I would advise Swedish government or any government to help Myanmar government assess uh, the, the richness of the place before they do anything. Because humanity, when they come in, they either tread on things and destroy. The same with ethnic groups they're talking about, whether they should get involved. I think we shouldn't force them. If they don't want it, we leave them alone. And well, we, we can't afford to do that because as we have a big neighbor that can just walk over us anytime. So we have to be wise to, to choose what we can save, what we can't save. We have to be wise, pragmatic, in terms of long-term uh, view. And when it comes to land grabbing, yes, uh, I myself, my ancestral lands were grabbed by the army. And I still haven't got it back yet. So there's a big issue, but it has to be uh, returned to the people. Partly because uh, the, the land grabbing has so many layers of complications. For example, a, some of ancestral lands, because we don't own, we have our private lands and also communal lands. And the tactics in those days were they want to build a military base, they said. So they just uh, plant landmines or put the fence around it, and they just build golf courses for army officers. Some years later, they cut it off in pieces and sell it to the companies. And that's how they, they did it. And that is a big problem, and it won't be solved by just forcing them. About someone has to point to the reality of uh, having these lands without any proper use and the local people because uh, it caused a lot of problems uh, in our area, not only for the uh, pe local people, but the, the people who come into our areas. They don't know that this land belonged to the local people and someone just sold in the middle and there still are clashes on their front. So they will need uh, not only uh, a good advice, but can good application of tools, as they call it here, tools to really diffuse this political landmine. I think that's my opinion. Thank you. I need, <clears throat> I'm going to need to wrap this up, but we had a specific question to you, Frida, about hotel change and uh, all the OECD um, committed to multinational companies. Yeah, so the answer to the question of we're going to report to the OECD, uh, the answer is no, we don't have any planning for that, to my knowledge, today. Uh, because today we kind of have been, or up to this point, we've been fo uh, focusing on organizing and educating uh, the workers in, in Myanmar at this moment. So we need to be having a strong organization in, within the country as well before we take kind of the next step. Yeah. We have a really brief question here from the Burmese to Frida, so I would like to... Sure, I, yeah, yeah, so I'll try to short. Yeah, so my name is also Aung, but I normally Aung, not a Dr. Aung. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, you can call me Aung. Uh, uh, actually, so I was studying uh, the, the tourism and 16 years ago at the Japanese University. So uh, well, my major subject was the internationals and mm -hmm. also the, the uh, difference between the mass tourism and sustainable tourism development and also ecotourism or native. Yeah, so, uh, and now, uh, what I want to ask you and hear, so you was mentioned the responsible tourism, so the owner paid a wage to the, the employers, and so uh, my question here is, and well, for the, for, I, I'm not sure, well, we just extend the European market for Japanese market, so we can, against to the uh, two company for the compliance matter, so because uh, now some of the two e travel agents, they want to do the mass tourism and they are asking, requesting the price down, price down, price down. So for sometimes so we have to work with the zero, uh, zero percent of the profits. But, but so for Japanese market, it's impossible. We, we often, again, say, well, we are talking with the compliance matter, so, but the SF finally. But 
I'm not sure, but uh, recently when I extend the Euro market, so they are, they are asking the, the quotations for, for seven, six or seven companies. So my question is, uh, do you have any recommendation or do you have any laws uh, the, for the two company have to care to get the profits of the local two operator or something like this? And that's one question. And also, one thing I just want to add is that I was in also the, the working at the JICA Expatriate for the Bacan Tourism Development um, uh, pilot projects, yeah, so, uh, so but, but in Bakan, that's forcing. Sorry, okay, okay. Sorry. So, maybe. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so the question was if I have any recommendation on how to. Oh, yes. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if I can recommend any kind of law in that. I mean, it, I would recommend that uh, to recognize trade unions and workers' rights. Uh, and that being a part of the human rights and coming together to negotiate and discussing these people together with the workers, I think that's most important. Uh, and then also educating yourself as an employee uh, and, and, and encouraging your employers to, to educate themselves on what their, their rights are and uh, best practices from other countries. Uh, and I think it's to have a, a dialogue about that, I think it's, it's the most important thing that you can do uh, to ensure that the profits you gain is also divided until to the workers as well. Yeah. Okay. I actually need to, to say thank you for coming and wrap this up. Uh, we have, first of all, I would like to say thank you for all our guests for coming here. Uh, we have some uh, prepared some sort of, of a gift from us. Um, thank you so much for then I would like to say to the audience, uh, I would like to say to the audience that uh, the, the, the delegation from Myanmar also have bag, bags. You can see them if you turn your head around. Yeah. It's got uh, various information about Myanmar in there. It's both tourist brochures, but also about how, how the strategy for, for the sustainable tourism is, is in place in, in Myanmar at the moment. And uh, there is also a lot of material from both HRF, from Unity Union, and Schysteres and the Fair Travel outside. Something with a video. Okay. Yeah, if you want to share the, the, what you have been uh, doing this morning, you can do so by sharing the link that is somewhere on the web page, I guess. Thank you. Thank you.